Have you noticed how things on the news recently seem to be all doom and gloom? By recently, I could easily go back over 200 years in this nation's history. Let's see, we have failed colonies, wars between Europeans and Native Americans, wars between various Native American tribes, between Europeans and their colonies. We have the curse of slavery, fights for rights, and it goes on right up to the current day with political division and social unrest, not to mention questions of COVID and the availability of vaccines. But you know, things weren't better before the discovery of the new world. Whether we want to talk about empires conquering each other, disease, starvation, slavery, or any other ill. It has been present since the dawn of time. Perhaps it would be more truthful to admit it goes all the way back to the time after the fall. Has there ever been a time when everyone could say that everything was good since then? The ancient Hebrews certainly wouldn't. While they lived under the death-dealing slavery of Egypt, or later, under oppressive kings, both their own and those who had conquered their land. Even when things weren't overtly oppressive, was there any good, say, to be found at Shiloh? We heard a little of that in our Old Testament lesson about the call of Samuel. The people might have asked, can anything good come out of Shiloh? We heard that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Yes, the Ark of the Covenant was there. It was the place of worship. This was long before David and his conquest of Jerusalem and Solomon's building of the first temple. Miracles still occurred at Shiloh, sometimes. A barren woman, a few years before, had prayed for a child, a son. Her husband hadn't demanded of her. He loved her, but her heart was broken, and she promised that the son, if he were born, would be dedicated to the Lord's service. The child was born and dedicated. His name was Samuel, the same child we heard in today's reading. However, all was not well there. Remember, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. The sons of Eli, the priest, who were also priests, were abusing their high calling. If we had read just a bit before our passage, we would have heard their sins. They did not follow the law on sacrifices. They even threatened force on those who said, you can have the whole sacrifice, just burn the fat. At the end of our reading, we heard that 
God's message to the boy Samuel spoke of the judgment. Those sons and their father Eli would die. Could anything good come out of Shiloh? Well, rare did not mean abandoned as we see in our text today. A child or a youth was called into service. He became the prophet Samuel, who faithfully and powerfully spoke the word of God. We could ask the same question about Babylon. Can anything good come out of it? It was a mighty pagan empire, worshiping many gods, which had conquered Israel and carried the people into captivity. The captives were renamed and pressed into government service, expected to eat non-kosher food and to pray to false gods, including the king. In fact, praying to God, the true God, became a capital offense. How could anything good come from there? To the people of faith, much good did come. You know the faithfulness of Daniel in the lion's den. But do you remember his three companions who wished only to eat vegetables and drink water? The one put in charge of them was afraid for his own life. But he took a chance, and these four young men thrived, becoming recognized for their ability. Top of their class, you might say. Oh, things got a bit warm for them in a fiery furnace when they wouldn't recant their faith. But they were not alone. Anything good? Well, besides the example of faithful lives lived under extreme conditions, we only have to look at our worship service a few weeks ago. A group of Gentiles came out of that region, and perhaps other areas as well, in response to a star which led them to Bethlehem and a house holding a child and his mother. Can anything good come out of Corinth, a cosmopolitan city of the Roman Empire known for its debauchery and corruption? There were literally temples and shrines on every street, often on every corner. Its population, and some say it ranked third in the empire of Rome, had a significant population of military veterans. Doesn't sound much like a place that would welcome a savior who had been crucified and resurrected, that would welcome a monotheistic religion and reject the religion of their family and ancestors. Yet we have the record of this faith-filled community from Paul's letters to them counseling them and encouraging them on their faith journey. Can anything good
good came out of Nazareth? Nathaniel asked the question. Today's gospel reading is in the days following Jesus' baptism by John. On the day following the baptism, John tells two of his disciples that Jesus is the Lamb of God. We know that one of them was Andrew, but both followed Jesus and heard him speak. Andrew's response was to go to his brother Simon Peter. Then, the following day, Jesus finds Philip. Could he have been John's second disciple? We don't know. But he responded. Then he too went out to tell what he had found to Nathaniel, who questions what good can come out of Nazareth. And friends, this is still a valid question. Nathaniel might very well have been simply looking down at the small village of Nazareth in comparison to Bethsaida. Or it could be something even more simple than that. There is no mention of Nazareth in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. No mention in any of the Messianic prophecies. No mention anywhere. How could the Messiah be coming from there? Did you notice that Philip doesn't argue with him? He simply invites him. Come. Come and see. You have to wonder how the pair traveled to see Jesus. Was Philip bubbling over with enthusiasm? Or maybe he just spoke earnestly about all he had heard in just one day of listening. How his, how his heart was, was changed how there was something about Jesus that he had never encountered before. Or maybe they just traveled in silence. Philip might have been just content to get him on the road, pointed in the right direction, and to really let him see and meet and talk with Jesus himself. You might wonder why Jesus says there was no deceit in him. Was it because he simply said what he honestly thought? What good can come out of Nazareth? Let's think about that, friends. Is it possible to live that way today? I would say yes, but many would say no. You need to parse your words so as not to give offense or to even deliberately cloud an issue, to conceal how you really feel about something. Sometimes you speak carefully because you want there to be absolute clarity. But other times it's used to obscure the issue at hand or even from taking a direct stand. We certainly see that in a political season as often politicians 
change their message depending on who they're speaking to. I'm not referring to different subject matter, but actually expressing diametrically opposed views and yes, promises. Something very good did come out of Nazareth. Good spelled with a capital G. Nathaniel was about to discover that and indeed did become one of Jesus' followers. The good had come into the world to bring the world back to God. Salvation had come. How would the world respond? So we must ask, can anything good come out of Dublin? Some might say no, pointing to the fact we're small and overshadowed by Peoria and Chicago and Springfield, not to mention the big cities on the East Coast or the West Coast. The powerful, as the world sees them, do not live here. Yet, we know our history that Lincoln, yes, the one who would become president, tried cases here. Others would point to our agricultural roots, agreeing that, well, agriculture is needed. It is critical, people do like to eat. It's not well respected in big cities, nor, I'm sad to say, by many politicians. Yet, we can point to many good things, our love for our children, and the value we place on education. The faith communities that work together for the good of all, as we strive to follow our Lord and Savior. The support and care that we offer our neighbors, often anonymously, the love that we show in a smile or a wave or a nod or just in the simple act of greeting even those who are strangers. Is everything perfect? Of course not. But there is much good in this community. How can we increase the good here? I think it's following the example of Philip. Reaching out to those we know and sharing the good news of the Messiah in humility, but also filled with joy. We are called to invite others to come to meet our Savior, virtually for now, but soon together in worship. While we wait for that time, let us pray that we can recognize those who will want to meet him and show in our own lives the difference he makes, has made in us. Amen and Amen.